Hello and welcome to Education Talk, one of your best programs on education on television in the country and Wilma. Now today we'll be looking at the global partnership on education, its impact around the world and various other issues on the news, what kids should be doing during the summer holiday and how to make up for the deficit in education. To discuss these various issues with me today is Dr. Chrissy Mafidon, an education consultant and a, an advisor to President Dr. Chrissy, you're very welcome to our studios. Thank you very much for inviting me. Let's look at the International Summit on Supporting Education in Developing Countries. Now, this summit has received pledges worth £16.8 billion. The UK has increased its contribution to the GPE to £300 million, which sends funding to 59 of the poorest countries. Let's take a look at the impact of GPE around the world. Partnership for Education began under the name Education for All Fast Track Initiative in 2002. Along the way, we have learned that education can break the cycle of poverty. Education develops economies and decreases dependence on aid. Education saves lives as surely as vaccinations and clean water do. In the last 10 years, we have grown from working in seven to 46 developing countries. Together, we have successfully mobilized $2.1 billion to improve access to quality education. Constructed over 30,000 classrooms, trained more than 337,000 teachers, and helped more than 19 million children go to school for the first time. The Fast Track Initiative has outgrown its old name. Today, we are the Global Partnership for Education. We believe that every child deserves the opportunity to learn, to read, to do math, and to excel. Whether they are girls, children in fragile states, children no longer left behind due to disability, or a woman who have never had the chance to read and now can. We are the only global fund focused on primary and early secondary education. We work together with developing countries to create their own education plans and increase domestic budgets to support them. Wherever there is a gap in funding, we bring donors and developing countries together to coordinate, mobilize and increase budget for quality education for all children. Nine years ago, more than 100 million children were not in school. Today, that number is down to 67 million. And we are not done yet. The cost to get the remaining children around the world into school is small, but the benefit is enormous. We're working towards a world where every child can live the dream of going to school. Join us. global partnership on education. Now, apart from raising funds, what else can governments do to ensure that education for all is possible? They're very practical steps because the money is not controlled. If you give money to any individual, it means that you've really get it, the power to control that money. The first thing is see how much of that can be changed to training. Let's get all the heads of schools in that area where we know there's very low recep reception for education and train them and see how they can be outreaches to other parents that have not sent their children to school. So training is one of them. Two, there's a huge ma set of materials available in the developed world right now that are by their standard, quote unquote, obsolete, but by the developing world standards, real ultra-modern. For example, we have white boards now being gotten rid of, and we have interactive boards being introduced to school. And we are even having a second generation interactive job boards. Meanwhile, the schools in developing countries have not even moved up the notch on that. So we can have a free flow of material that is considered still very functional. Computers are available in, in the West are very functional. But because the operating system is new, what happens? You have an upgrade. When you have an upgrade, both your hardware and your software literally gotten rid of. 
And there's a problem with getting rid of that because of environmental concern. Mm -hmm. Why don't you just solve that problem by giving to schools in developing areas where I've had the privilege of visiting schools in some of the developing world, and a whole school does not even have a single laptop, let alone computer. So the desktop that is considered obsolete by the West can easily be shipped down here. And then the students have the wonderful opportunity of interacting with proper desktop computers and seeing real desktop applications and industrial-based applications that they can learn from. So you're having direct education to both the staff and the student by a direct exposure to, of this material. So, and there should be twinning of schools, collaboration of schools. Schools in one part of the world hooking up to another set of schools in an, on a mass basis. This is every single school in the developing world should be twinned with schools in the developed world. Which means in the developing world, one of the schools should actually adopt a school in the, in the underdeveloped world. Absolutely. If you adopt a school, you see what their challenges are. You understand their opportunities. Because there are always opportunities when there are challenges. So both sides will learn from each other and learn to appreciate each other's um, um, strengths and weaknesses and be able to literally compensate for each other's strengths or weaknesses. For example, there is no much motivation in schools in the West. The student's hunger and thirst and yearning for learning is very low. But if you contrast that with that in the developing world, where every single opportunity is captured and, in fact, struggled for and fought for, then some of us in the West, in the comfort of the West, might wake up to the fact that these things that we are taking for granted are of extreme value to other people. One of the challenges faced in the developing world is uh, the parents releasing the kids to go to school. Sometimes because of the level of poverty, they actually sell, send the kids to the market to actually sell things instead of sending them to school. Now how can that be dealt with? That is an important thing, having the parents release the kids to go to school. It, they cannot release the children to go to school because they haven't seen value in it. It's not essentially because of poverty. Poverty may be a factor, but the real reason is value. If you know that if you send your daughter to school and the daughter goes to school for 10, 15 years and eventually goes to university and becomes a doctor, of course you want your daughter to be a doctor. Or if your daughter becomes a lawyer or becomes an engineer or becomes a writer or becomes whatever that final destination is, if that is given to them as a carrot, most people will run and want to get it. They don't see any immediate benefit of literacy and numeracy. Because what you're giving them now is opportunity to be literate and numerate. So why should I be literate and numerate? You're saying you will get better jobs. Why should I be literate and numerate? I will become a better person in the society. So if that value, if that level of education is passed on to parents, and then parents see strategic case studies that have been given back to them, that somebody that left from the community availed themselves of the wonderful opportunity of education and then became leaders in the community, that will again have a big continuum. It spreads within the environment as, oh, girls that go to school become big women, become very, very famous women, or become rich women. You will then associate education as a direct path to fame, to stardom, or to stability in terms of job opportunities and employment. Which means an awareness campaign needs to be trialed in those developing countries. A very, very uh, massive one. We need to do that and do it very quickly. Now, let's take a look at some statistics. And looking at these statistics, we have some schools still under the bridges. Figures published by UNESCO on Thursday showed that there are still 58 million children without any access to schools and that progress has been stalled since about 2007. Also girls are particularly likely to miss out on school. What we've got to face up to is that there are 61 million children who are not going to school that there are 500 million girls who will never complete their education, and that there are three quarters of a billion adults who are illiterate because they've never had the chance of education. And what we've now got to do as part of Education First, which brings together all the organizations concerned about education under the leadership of the Secretary General of the United Nations, is create a momentum for change between now and the end of 2015, remind people that we are committed to achieving the universal 
education goal by the end of 2015 and work with organizations like Education International, which uh, represents uh, 30 million teachers and educators, to raise public awareness about the right of every single child in the world uh, to have a basic education. If by the end of 2015 we can mobilize the resources, we can hire the teachers, we can build the schools, we can deliver the educational materials, and we could then be the first generation in history that is able to say that every single child is going to get an education. Former Prime Minister Gordon Brown, UN Global Education Envoy, says we could be the first generation in history that is able to say that every single child is going to get an education. Now, Dr. Chris, do you think that can be achieved by the end of 2015? That is his target, and if that can be achieved, what needs to be done? Um, 2015 is a bit too sudden. You cannot have a global coverage by 2015. It will literally almost take a whole generation to wipe up any serious disease. So if you're looking at polio, if you look at all the other pre um, diseases that we've seen have been wiped up, it's taking time. If you don't have a systematic plan to be able to get it out, you'll find out that you just paper over some cracks and it will seem as if we've achieved our goal and then we'll come back again and find out that literally there were pockets that were missed out. They were within built from down up, we built from top down. Each time you have a top down target, it's always a problem. So what must be done is a total understanding of every single government that every child has some talents in them has some gifts in them. Now, if we are very clear in our minds, then the Ministry of Education that operate literally as appendages of political apparatus will not, because we now have real Ministry of Education that has one goal in mind, and that goal is to get every single boy, every single girl, make valuable contribution, irrespective of the party in power. Because when there is a change of administration, there's a change of priority. And if there's a change of priority, you find out that one particular Secretary of State for Education in a country will now be changed. And if that is changed, the, the emphasis will change. The policy will change. And the, the, for instance, we've had countries that were committed to universal primary education. And then when there was a change in government, they switched from universal primary education to vocational education for their youths because they wanted to tackle youth unemployment which is a laudable thing to do. But be beneath that means that the children will now suffer from the ages of 5 to 11. So we'll miss out in a whole generation now where we will not literally have the foundation laid for them. So you cannot rob Peter to pay Paul. You've got to have a consistent focus on that primary education and say every single boy or girl must be exposed to opportunities for their talents to be developed. And then don't split Ministry of Education from Ministry of Employment because the two of them interface. They, f they literally fuse into one. If you employ your, your people, it's because they have the skills. If you hire any person, it's because the person has the skills or the education or can do the job. Therefore, provide the, the opportunity for them to develop those skills and education. So that's what we should be looking at. Ministry of Education all by itself will not be able to meet the UNESCO, the UNESCO target. You have to have a cabinet broad, a broad coalition within the cabinet. And then the finance department must also understand that it's an economic issue. If you have too many people unemployed, criminality will go on. If criminality goes on, you have to then invest money to deal with the criminality. If, if you had preempted that criminality by first of all investing in their primary education, you would not have that big burden that countries are saddled with. So it's, uh, it has to be a joint up. Um, well communicated, well understood by government, and therefore pursue it as they do with health. Education should be elevated to the post of health, or the same priority as we do with health. Do you think every government should be encouraged to uh, shrine it into their constitution that education should be a priority, no matter the political party in power? They do. Some of them, most governments do now, is how you define your priority. Someone say, yeah, education is a priority. We will give facilities for teachers. We will sponsor the training of teachers. That's why most training of teachers are done free at the university level. But what happens 
is the implementation of that priority. It's good for you to have to give free training to teachers, therefore pull people into the profession, but you have to understand that it takes much more than training teachers. It, like you mentioned earlier, it takes reorientation of parents to understand the value in education. It takes getting the community together to say, look, if we have a lot of our children in this community that are developed, we will export talent. We don't just import talent. That means we don't just invite doctors from other communities to come and help us with health. We will be able to produce enough doctors that will go to other communities to help them with health. So it's a valid economic enterprise if you say you want to train every single boy or girl in the community because you will eventually export skills and knowledge and, and that empowers your community and that makes you literally a potential world power. Let's look at the schools. Let's come back home now. London schools are doing very well. I mean, it's out there on the news this morning. London schools have outperformed all the schools around the country. What can we do to motivate the students in other schools elsewhere apart from London? We need to let the students see the finished product. Most students see pen, paper, teacher, pen, paper, classmates. They don't see that writing your exam, doing well in exam, will lead to pay. They don't see how much you will lose if you're not a graduate. If you have a great skill, but you don't have university education, it's been worked out, they lose close to 250,000 pounds across a li or their working life. Now, if you, if you understand the pain involved with anything, most people will re respond to that pain. If you understand the pleasure associated with a particular venture, they will treat it differently. So if you see that students that finish top of the class end up getting better paid jobs, and you see it, not you are told of it, you see it, so you move into jobs. That means you go for job placements, and then you, you get to a place and say, what is the difference between the manager and the cleaner? What is the difference between the top paying person in any firm and the least paid person? They would, you, you work it out for yourself. You know, it's the level of education, is the emphasis they place on training, and it's how they develop themselves. You know what you do? You run back and do and do likewise. So they need to see practical examples. They need to be exposed to the job, to be, yeah. Yeah, the job market and see the reality down the line. Because it's not just a piece of paper. Most students think it's a piece of paper that says you've got an A in this or you've got a B in this. It's much more than that piece of paper. That piece of paper becomes the ticket for your meals. It's your meal ticket you're you are printing if you get good grades. If you get lousy grades, you've also printed a very lousy meal ticket and you will not be able to achieve all you want to do. Your self-confidence will completely wither because when you see someone that has more skills and more knowledge than, than you are, you are intimidated. So but if you know that you have the same level of skills and knowledge, that's, that's not something you worry about. You go into discussions, you go into negotiation, and you get your place in the society. Let's talk about the summer holidays now. Um, some schools are already going on summer and the learning deficit. Some of the parents say, oh, I found out at the end of the term, my child isn't actually up to level four or the level expected of the child. What can I do to regain this lost learning during the summer? In the summer months, it's a, a great opportunity as well as something that others will see as a real setback. It's a setback in the, in the sense that you don't have formal learning taking place. But if you're someone that believes that learning takes place not only in the classroom, but also takes place in the museums, then you find out that a visit to the museum will expose your son or your daughter to more opportunities. If you find out that learning takes place, for instance, if you go shopping, there is a learning value there. Because in, in the case of shopping, you are engaging in a transaction. Anytime transaction occurs, there's learning taking place. So if you are a parent and you know that your son or your daughter may be weak in one aspect or the other, you expose that child to aspects that will either reinforce or extend the knowledge already acquired. So you have summer programs. I know the Excellence Education has uh, summer programs. You have summer schools. Make sure that your son participates or your daughter gets involved in it. Why? You will see first hurt what chemistry is if you are involved in activities that support that body of knowledge. You see what biology is. You, so you know that join, when a child comes back to the new academic year, the child is from coming back from a position of strength, not that of weakness. Because what most people do now is they shut the books, so wow, holidays come, shut the books and shut down every form of 
knowledge acquisition, shut down every form of learning and play for the entire six weeks. And at the end of the six weeks, they found out that what they were taught in the previous year, they've even forgotten. So when they come back with a new year in September, they are struggling with the new body of knowledge that they have been given. So most times, they spend the first half of the term revising what they were taught in the previous year. And that's a setback. And that setback lingers on and carries on. So the best thing most parents, and we're, the advice to do, we, we, we have a, a seminar coming up that literally shows you non-academic but educational activity. We'll come to your seminar, <laughs> interestingly. But the emphasis during the summer shouldn't be on the classroom style of learning no. for the child. No, no. If a child wants to be an author or be a journalist, tell him to go get newspapers and then read through the newspaper. Don't tell them the pages they must read in the newspaper. Ask the son or your daughter to pick up the newspaper and read any of the articles there. So if he loves sports, he turns to the sports pages, reads the sports pages, and they say, can you tell me what you learned there? What you're doing, you are reinforcing comprehension. If you get them to write a synopsis of it or write a summary of it, you don't need to be an English teacher to teach English. You just need to expose him to materials like this. So he writes it, and then you can come back and discuss it with him. Just by discussing, he's reflecting on his work. He will pick up 80% of his errors. So you don't need to be a teacher. This is statistics. 80% of the errors I make, if I'm given a second opportunity in a more relaxed environment, I'll pick that up. Because it's in a more relaxed environment. Yeah, because now in a, in a more relaxed environment. So get your son or your daughter to get involved in that. Then get your children, if they watch any TV program, fantastic. You screen the TV program ahead of time. They don't just sit and watch impulsively. No, you have to say, okay, you're not going to watch on impulse. Tell me what TV programs you're going to watch tomorrow. And then what you're going to watch day after and so okay if you're going to watch this program what do you think you're going to gain from it so you do it as a, a deliberate act and when he's watching the program he's watching for entertainment as well as education, education. because he knows he's going to come back to you to discuss the highlights of the program or write a small synopsis of that so you can engage the child in a million ways that will make the child enjoy the learning without studying, because studying is making it academic. Education, like I said, broadens it out. And you are able to go on a trip. If you're going on a trip, let's sit down. How far do you think this place is? Let's work it out. You call up Google Map. You say, this is the length of the journey. This is how long it's likely going to take us. What are you doing? You're doing a mathematical exercise. You're not working out. We're traveling from point A to point B. This is how long it's supposed to take. This is why should we go by train or should we go by road? If we went by road, how long will it take? If we're going by train, when are the train times? Looking at the train timetable and calculating when we arrive on the other side is a mathematical exercise. Now, before we go to year seven admissions, last week we talked about the apps, developing apps, especially by our young stars. And one of the things you talked about coming up is your webinar, your creative thinking webinar, which is going to help the child. Now, tell us more about the webinar. The creative thinking webinar means you will be given a problem you're familiar with. You will now work through what answer you give for that problem. Then that comp problem will be made slightly more complicated. And then you come up with a different answer. And then we stretch even further. And then you give up. So what you're doing, you're gradually getting the student to get into the mood of thinking and coming up with solutions for themselves. And in creative thinking, no answer is right, no answer is wrong. You just have to say, what if we think of this? What if we modify this? So the fear from the students, oh, I might get this right, I might get it, is completely wiped out. You tell them the only wrong answer is a no answer. That's, so that's, 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 that's the action. In other words, they learn to think outside the box. They learn to think outside the box. They learn to improve on the results they gave before. They learn to improve on the suggestions they made before. They, then they sit down with their peers. And nothing is more encouraging when your peers look at things and tell you because you are now saying, oh, if my peer knows that, if my friend knows that, I should have known that as well. Unlike if the teacher knows that, you say, okay, the teacher knows it because he's a teacher. He's taught this subject over and over again. So you now have what, what is called peer feedback and peer assessment. And from that, you say, oh, ah, my friend that is five months older than me or two, ye two weeks older than me also knows this and is confronting this problem. So you now get multiple perspective because all of them are about the same age. All of them give the same problem. They're coming up with different solutions. Next time they see a problem, they know that there's not one solution to every problem. Unlike in the classroom where you are told there's one right answer. In real life, 
uh, uh, creative thinking, there's no one right answer. You come up with multiple answers that can then give you part of the puzzle that you are trying to fix. Let's talk about the parents, parents who find out their children are savvy when it comes to technology. How can they help their children to start writing apps from the age of nine? Because we have kids who are already coding and writing apps from even the ages of eight and nine, ten. It's exposure, exposure, and then supervision. If we were going to buy a new phone today, who should you discuss with? Should you discuss with A, the salesman that's going to sell it? Or should you go and do your research independently? Or would you like to ask your little boy or girl that you might think they are not technical, but you'll be surprised at what they tell you. So if you're buying a new phone, find out from them. If you're going to buy a new tablet, computer tablet, find out from them. If you're going to buy a new laptop, find out from them. Why? If you send them on that errand, they'll be forced to research for you. And the product of their research is that say, oh, I think you should buy X model because of this. You should buy the other make because of this. And they'll give you their reasons. So what you're doing is really reinforcing what the child always knew about computer science and about computer technology, but without calling it, dressing it up academically as a yep. computer. They see it as an electronic gadget. They, th they think computers are electronic consumer products. They are not. They've transformed a long time ago. They are proper computer science devices. So from there, you now expose them to softwares that are available. The software run the hardware. So your, your hardware may be very good. If you don't have good enough software, you're not going to get the benefits of it. From there, the student or your child becomes a student of software. He understands that if you download a particular full application, you get this result. But if you download an app, this is the type of result you get. So he knows that an app is a small or a mini version of a software. So it, it's, it's always fascinating. So you don't need to have a master's degree in software engineering to be able to make a, a genius out of your son or your daughter that is keen on using software. Interestingly, we need to round up now, but just before we go, year seven admissions, what should parents do? Every single parent that has a child in year five now, today, must go on to the website of the local authority. If you don't know what local authority you are in, email us with your postcode, we'll send you back the name of your local authority. You must know the four top schools in the area. You must. You must know the four uh, average schools in the area and the four bottom schools in the area. And then do your research pre the academic year, before the academic year ends. If you don't do it before the academic year ends, you've lost a big advantage that you can give your son or your daughter. And most parents may not find out well. If you need more information, just send emails to educationtalk at lovotv.co.uk. Thank you so much for coming, Dr. Chris. We look forward to having you next week. Thank you. Viewers, this is Education Talk. Enjoy the rest of our programs.